Thank you, Miss Kim. Steve, Carol. Y'all pray for Miss Kim. She's been, she's had a long day. Uh, she had to drive a bunch of kids to Raleigh Airport this morning, I think. Is that correct? To Raleigh Airport. So she was up early, out early, and been busy all day. And I'm guessing probably pretty much left school and came here. So uh, we appreciate her being here tonight. Uh, she's the only one that has permission to go to sleep during the service, Miss Kim and, and Avery. Uh, when you get to be 93 years old, you sleep anywhere you want, right? But uh, anyway, glad you're here tonight. I'm going to start in Acts chapter 2 tonight. Uh, I really want to get through this message. I don't know that I will, but I'm going to try my best. But I want to get through this message, and, uh, and then I've got another message that ties directly in with this that I want to preach either Sunday morning or next Wednesday. Just haven't decided that yet. That's all, that's all up to the Lord. But I just want to talk about fellowship and the importance of fellowship. Uh, and I, I think the reason the Lord laid it on my heart is because one thing that I know COVID has done, uh, you know, not just here, but other churches as well, but it's, it's broken the fellowship amongst the brethren, uh, the people who come to church. Now, I'm not faulting people who are not coming. Don't take this the wrong way, uh, because I know people have concerns about COVID, and uh, some have been sick, some have been very sick, and we understand that. But one thing COVID has done has broken the fellowship of our people. We used to run about 200 here on Sunday morning. And uh, because of, you know, we've shut down. We had to shut down initially because the government shut us down. And, and we came back, we, you know, we had, you know, maybe a little over half of our crowd. And we didn't have a COVID case for seven months. And then in October, we had a COVID case. So one COVID case, we shut down two weeks. Uh, and, um, and, and so we started back up. And we didn't have quite as many come back after we shut down that second time. And then just, a, you know, five or six, seven weeks ago, we had another bit of an outbreak here. I'll just put it that way. And, uh, and so we shut down again for about four weeks. And this time we had even less people come back. And we understand that. But one thing COVID is doing is breaking up our fellowship. And, uh, and I want to talk to you tonight about the importance of fellowship. Let's just look at Acts chapter 2. Verses 41 and 42 to use kind of for a springboard here. And we know this is the early church. Uh, and Peter has been preaching on the day of Pentecost. And you know what? There's going to be thousands that get saved. Uh, and it says in verse 41 that uh, then they gladly received his word. They were baptized. In the and, the and that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls one day. And now that's preaching, ain't it? And then it says in verse 42, look at this, it's, a, it's just full of amazing stuff in verse 42. And they, talking about the early church, those who were making up the early church, they continued steadfastly, in the, and, we could, and we could read it this way, by the way, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread, and they continued steadfastly in prayers. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We thank you for your word, its power, its clarity, its accuracy. Lord, I thank you for the privilege I have to stand before these people and preach your word just a little while tonight. And I pray you'd give me just what I need exactly when I need it, that I might be a blessing to these people. But most of all, that my message may be pleasing unto you, Lord, that it may be challenging to our people, but pleasing as well. I pray, Lord, that you'd guard, guide, and give my mouth. Help me say exactly what you would have me to say that would be a sweet-smelling savor unto thee. For it is in Christ's name I pray, and for his sake, amen. The word fellowship is used 14 times in the New Testament. It's even used twice in the Old Testament. I never thought about it when I started researching this. I really never thought about the word fellowship being in the Old Testament. But it's in Leviticus 6.2 and it's also in Psalm 94.20. Here the psalmist asked a question and it's, a, it's kind of a negative thing. But he said, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? And obviously the answer is not. We don't want to have fellowship with the throne of iniquity. But that's the two times it's used in the Old Testament. It's used 14 times in the New Testament, but it's never used in the four Gospels. That kind of surprised me. I, I thought for sure the word fellowship would be in one of the four Gospels, but it's not. Now, I will say this. I'll probably say it again at the end of the message. We know that John speaks a lot about unity 
in, in John's gospel, especially when, he, when he's recording uh, Christ's high intercessory prayer in John 17. Of course, that is a prayer of Jesus. And Jesus mentions, uh, I mean, he really emphasizes the importance of unity amongst the believers in that prayer. And John records that. And so here, here's the thing I'm just going to insert, uh, you know, just for no extra charge. But if unity is important to Christ, it ought to be important to us. And unity is, and by the way, fellowship is as well, but unity, the definitions of unity and fellowship, they're closely linked together. They're, because for us to be in real Christian fellowship, we have to be in unity. We not only have to be in unity with, with each other, but before we can be in unity and fellowship with each other, we got to be in unity with God because if I get out of God's will, I'm going to be miserable and nobody's going to want to be around me. Nobody's going to want to fellowship with me and so on and so forth. So there are at least four different, now it's not mentioned in the Gospels, but it is mentioned a lot in some of Paul's writings, obviously, but there are at least four different Greek words that translate fellowship in the New Testament. But the word that's most often used, I think it's 11 of the times, of the 14 times the word is used, I think it's 11 times, it's the same Greek word, and it's called konania. Konania, it carries the meaning, listen, sharing which one has in anything, a communion or an intimacy. Here's the thought. And I think this is from maybe from Wearsby to share with others what one has in order to meet their needs. To share with others, it's talking about fellowship. The, the main idea behind fellowship is to share with others what one has to meet their needs. Sometimes all I need is some good fellowship. To meet a need, uh, let's say you're tired and you're emotionally drained, and I uh, and and I can understand how people get like that because we we just go and go and go and go. Uh, Sunday night when we got through a service, Carol and I and Steve and Pat and Glenn and Tammy Claudio went to Dario's in Archdale. Now that's not a plug for Dario because they're the, that's the only Dario's I've been to that doesn't have Diet Mountain Dew. I hope somebody from that program is watching. All right, but uh, anyway, we we went there, got us a hot dog and you know drink and that kind of thing, and. After we had finished eating, uh, we probably sat around another hour just fellowshipping. Uh, last night, I, I called Steve. I said, yesterday afternoon, I said, Steve, what are you and Pat doing for dinner? He said, Pat's making taco salad. I said, okay. I said, uh, me and Carol going out. I just wanted to see if you wanted to go out with us. And he said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. He said, it's chicken pie night over at Pizza Wing King. That is a plug for them because they do serve Diet Mountain Dew. But anyway, he said this chicken pie night at Pizza Wing King. And I said, well, I said, you're doing taco salad. He said, let me call you back. He called me back. He said, if we go to Pizza Wing King, we're going. And so we met over there last night about 6 o'clock. And once again, we finished our meal and we fellowshiped. We just, and, and it did me a lot of good, and I know it did Steve and Pat a lot of good, and Carol, just to sit and fellowship with people and catch up and talk about things in the church, talk about, uh, I mean, we can talk about anything and everything, but always we, we talk some about the Scripture, we talk some about the Lord, and so on and so forth. But it's, a, it's sharing with others uh, when they have a need, and it helps me to do that. Hopefully it helps you as well. Glenn Claudio sent me a, an email uh, Monday morning, and uh, thanked us for having here to give us a report and thanked us uh, for just everything. But he said, I want you to know we enjoyed that fellowship with you and Miss Carol and Pat and Steve. And so fellowship is vital to our spiritual lives, I believe. Now, I want to look at fellowship quickly, if we can, from three different perspectives. If we First, I wanted to look at the negatives concerning fellowship. There's three of them. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to all these passages. I've got some of them written down. I'm going to turn to a couple of them. But uh, first of all, there's three negatives. Here's the first one. We should have no fellowship with devils. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 20, 10 and verse number 20, and it says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. And not to God. That's a capital G. They sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So you know, that we don't have to have a, 
a rocket scientist's brain and we don't have to have a degree in theology or eschatology or hermeneutics or anything else to understand that. Christians should have no fellowship with devils. Now, let's think about we, we should not only have no fellowship with devils, but we should also not be fellowshipping in the devices of the devil. Let, let, me, let me say this. The best definition I ever heard of sin was this. If God says do it and you don't, it's sin. If God says don't do it and you do it, it's sin. I mean, that's about as simple a definition as you get. And I'm guessing there's a lot of Christians who would say, I would never have fellowship with the devil. But they still get involved with his devices every day, watching things they shouldn't watch, listening to things they shouldn't listen to, hearing things they shouldn't hear, telling things they shouldn't tell. You know what I'm talking about? I'll shut up and keep going on now. How can you do that? I don't know. I'll get off that horse and maybe get on another one. Let's put it this way. Christians should have no fellowship with devils. Also, Christians should not pursue relationships with lost people. Now, once again, everybody knows this. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not, 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 be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And so we know this is talking about in the marriage and that Christians should never marry non-Christian. That yoking, of course, pictures the oxen or beast of burden in a yoke, and they are yoked together, and they work together, and they live together, and they do everything together while they're yoked, and that's what it's talking about here. Third thing, negative. Christians should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It's Ephesians 5.11, if you're taking notes. Christians should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So you say, preacher, what are the unfruitful works of darkness? It translates ungodliness and immorality. Christians should have no fellowship with ungodliness or immorality. Now, I could pull up and park there for a while, but that's not the main theme of my sermon tonight. Second point, and we've looked at three negatives concerning fellowship. Second thing is this. Christians should... There's all these things you should not have fellowship with, but they should have fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Guess what? There's three of these as well. Jot it down. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says this. God is faithful by whom you were called. It means uh, invited. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this word called, I said, means invited. We have been invited by God himself to enter a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, this invitation requires an RSVP. He's extending the offer. He's extending the invitation. I want you to have a relationship with my son, Jesus Christ. I want you to have a, God saying, I want you to have a relationship with me through my son, Jesus Christ. The reason he came to the earth and lived a sinless life, born of a virgin, and the reason he went to Calvary and died on that cross, and the reason he, uh, that he rose again on the third day is so that I, Almighty God, could have fellowship with the most important part of my creation, and that's mankind. Ephesians tells us that we are His workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 said, Paul says, we are His workmanship. It means we are His masterpiece. Think about all the things God has created. And man, you can, you can look at pictures and you can go places and you can see some of the most beautiful places you've ever seen. Carol and I have been blessed to travel just a little bit. And uh, one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen is Galilee, believe me. But I, I love waterfalls and I like to go see waterfalls. Uh, I like to, uh, we love, when we were in, uh, on that cruise to Alaska, my goodness, that was just absolutely, some of the views were just breathtaking. And, so, and you know what I'm talking about. But think about all the things things he's created, the sun and the moon and the stars, all the galaxies, we, the ones we know about, the ones we don't know about. He, I mean, out of all the things that God created, he said, we are his masterpiece. And I want to have fellowship with my masterpiece. And the only way I can have fellowship with my masterpiece, you got to come through my son, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only door. Read John chapter 10. He's the only door into heaven. Somebody say amen. 
Well, God is faithful by whom you were invited into a fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Then Philippians 2, chapter 1 says, if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Now, first it was with God through the Son. But if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Kenneth Weiss translates the word fellowship in this verse. And that is Philippians 2, 1, if I didn't call it out. But Kenneth Weiss translates the word fellowship here as partnership. And he implies that this partnership, that it speaks of a partnership where the Holy Spirit gives us aid in living the Christian life. Patricia, there's no way in this world I can live a Christian life without him. Absolutely no way in this world. Honey, there's no way you can live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit of God in you. And so for everybody to say, we have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. But we cannot live a life of this pleasing unto God without it. And that's what he said. He said we're in a partnership with the Holy Spirit because he is inside of us. That's what he's talking about, that fellowship. And then in 1 John 1, 3, truly, uh, John says here, truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, on Sunday night, Glenn Clodjo opened with this, after his update, when he began to preach, he opened with the question, are you a Jesus fan or are you a Jesus follower? And then he went on to explain the difference. He just did a magnificent job with that. But let me ask a question tonight, kind of the same thought line. Do you have a friendly feeling of affection for Jesus or are you walking in close fellowship and having daily communion with Him. You know, when we say we love Jesus, you know, there's those three different words for love, and there's that, uh, there's that Philadelphia love, uh, that word Philadelphia, brotherly love. There's that word phileo, which means a friendly feeling, affection, fondness. Do you just have a brotherly love for Christ? Do you have a friendly feeling of affection for Him? Or do you have uh, agape, that self-sacrificial divine kind of love, and you want to love him with your heart, mind, body, and soul. You want to follow as close as you possibly can. You want to have daily fellowship with him, and you want to have daily communion with him. Christians should have a strong desire to fellowship with the Heavenly Father through his Son, through his Word, through his sweet Holy Spirit. We should have a desire to fellowship with Him. I want you to note two things about fellowship with God. Number one, every time we sin, we break fellowship with God. And there can be no fellowship with Him until we genuinely confess our sin and plead for His forgiveness. Second thing, if you don't have a strong desire to fellowship with the Father, there's one of two things going on in your life. Either you're totally out of God's will or you've never been truly saved. If you don't have a strong desire to fellowship with God through His Holy Spirit, through His Son, through His Word, fellowshipping with His people, you don't have that desire. There's something wrong. You're either out of God's will or you've never been saved. So Christians should have fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. I think I got time to finish. Lastly, Christians should enjoy fellowship with one another. And this is really what I wanted to get to. Christians should have fellowship one with another. Guess what? There's three of these as well. Three of these as well. Acts 2.42, I read it to open up the service tonight. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. J. Vernon McGee talks about this verse, Acts 2.42, and he calls these the four footprints of the church. I'll give them to you quickly from J. Vernon McGee. The four footprints, all found in this one verse, the four footprints of the church, the apostles' doctrine. And he said this, it's not pretty pulpits, pretty people, or pretty printed programs, or even pretty organized programs that are important in a godly church. Preaching true doctrine is absolutely vital to having a church that's pleasing unto God. Second thing, not only the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread. Some people think this means just the Lord's Supper. 
But I think, this is my opinion, I think it speaks more here, not only of the communion, but having fellowship meals in one another's homes. If you were to look, I'm going to turn back there and, uh, in Acts chapter 2 again. But if you were to look in Acts chapter 2, and I think it's verse number 46. I think I moved my paper clip. But Acts 2, 46, uh, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. It sounds like they were going from house to house having fellowship meals together. And I think it's what it's talking about here, not just communion, but having the breaking of bread, the fellowship as well. So four, four footprints of the church, the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, prayers, I think one thing that would do our churches a lot of good is to put more effort into prayer, more time into prayer, not just in the services themselves, but if pastors would challenge their people more and more to pray more fervently, to pray more often, to pray more urgently, to pray, 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 because when we fail to pray, we fail to include God. And if we, uh, without Him, we can do absolutely nothing, uh, the book of John tells us. So think about that. What Christ said, Christ said, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. And if we fail to pray, we fail to include him. So we're working on our own. It's just like the, uh, the fishermen who were fishing after Christ had been uh, resurrected from the dead. And Peter, you know, he'd shown himself to the apostles on two occasions. And at some point, Peter got frustrated. He said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to doing what I was doing before I met this man, Jesus. I'm going fishing. And he took about six more with him. And they fished all night and hadn't caught anything uh, because they were fishing in their own power. And Jesus shows up on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias the next morning, probably still dark. And he says, hey, guys, have you caught anything? Well, they didn't want to answer that because they hadn't caught anything. They're, some of them professional fishermen. And uh, so they didn't like being asked if they caught anything, Kevin. They hadn't caught anything, fished all night, professional fishermen, and hadn't caught anything. The second thing they hated worse than that, when he says, when somebody who's not a fisherman, or they didn't think, tells them how to do it. <laughs> hey, cast your net on the other side and you'll be okay. And, oh, good grief, who's this guy think he is? And they cast the net on the other side, and what happens? Has so many fish, it starts to break the net. And Peter said, it's the Lord. And he takes off and goes. What am I saying? Without him, they could accomplish nothing. But when they did it God's way, great things happen. And if we want to do it God's way, we have to incorporate him into our lives through the means of prayer. It's vital that God's children pray, pray, pray. How many of you in this building, and I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see. How many of you remember Dr. Mark Kors? Raise your hand. Calvary Baptist Church in Winston. Some of you, well, Carol knows him pretty well. Uh, he's home with the Lord now, but Martha, you probably remember him from uh, the youth program here way back over at Sumner. Uh, what was that called? Youth for Christ? Youth for Christ. He was doing that before he was a pastor. But Mark Kors, you know, he, that church he had over there at Calvary, it grew and grew and grew. And I think by the time he uh, retired for health reasons, they were probably running at least 3,500, maybe 4,000 radio programs, TV programs, all this. And I heard him say this one night. He's talking about their groups going out on visitation. He said they meet at the church and they give out names for people, you know, families to go see. He said, we pray for five minutes. And then we go visit for maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Here's what he said. We would be much better to pray for an hour and a half and go visit for five minutes. And I would say amen to that. Most people don't want you in their home an hour and a half, right? Uh, they want to watch reruns of something. But, I mean, think about that. Mark Kors, who was one of the most brilliant men I've ever met, he said we'd be much better off on visitation to pray for an hour and a half and go visit for five minutes. We need to pray. So four footprints, the apostles' doctrine, breaking the bread, prayers, prayer, 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 and then fellowship is one of those things that he mentions. And the thought of continuing in the teaching of the apostles is carried through in this word fellowship. And it reads this way in the original language. And they were giving constant attention to the teachings of the apostles and to that which they held in common, fellowship, that which they held in common with them. I think when we gather for Christian fellowship, there should be less talk about sports, social media, current events, and more discussions and more sincere discussions about the things of Christ. I told you there were three, Acts 2.42. 
they continue steadfastly in fellowship. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, understand that. I'm going to say something about this quickly, and then we're going to move on. But I'm going to read that verse again. If we walk in the light, it's about being obedient to God's command. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. So now we see for certain that having true Christian fellowship with one another is directly related to walking in obedience to God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. If I'm out of the will of God, the Holy Spirit inside of me will let me know that. I mean, I mean, any Christian knows that. Any Bible teacher, any Bible preacher knows that. If you're a child of God, you got the Holy. If you're a child of God, you do have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And if you sin, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you about that. And you can't be in proper Christian fellowship with anybody else until you get that settled. So to be to have this fellowship that John's talking about here, we must be in obedience to God's commands. 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, he says, declare we unto you. That's the main part of the verse here. He's declaring something. Why? That ye may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with His Son, Jesus Christ. John says here that we are declaring these things that he's listed in verses 1 and 2. He says, we're declaring these things to you so that you might have fellowship with us, he says, with us. Every Christian ought to have a desire to share the wonderful love of Jesus Christ. The news of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story. Avery, when we used to go in the nursing homes, we'd always open with, I love to tell the story of Jesus and His love. And Paul's talking about declaring here. And he says one of the ways that we keep our fellowship fresh is when God's children are declaring or sharing our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why do you say that? We're not supposed to just take the things we learn from God's Word and soak them up like a sponge and just keep them to ourselves. We're to go out and share it with others, tell other people about it. That's why we are to learn it, to, to read it, to receive it, to believe it, to hear it, to understand it, so that we might share it with others. And that's what John's talking about here. I'll give you a couple of points to ponder and I'm done. If you went to a fellowship Say we'll call it a gathering, but it could also be called a fellowship. But if you went to a gathering of avid baseball fans, you would expect that most of the conversations with all these baseball fans would involve stories about baseball games, baseball players, baseball plays, great plays they've seen, things like that. If you went to a fellowship, maybe a, a car show, and uh, a bunch of car buffs, you know, you can call it a fellowship, a gathering, whatever you want to call it, but if you went to a fellowship of car buffs, you're going to expect the conversations to involve stories about cars, muscle cars, classic cars, race cars, et cetera, et cetera. If you attend a fellowship or a gathering of Christians, shouldn't the conversations focus on Christ? Does that just not make sense? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't ever talk about anything else, not even in the foyer of the church. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm just, I'm just simply suggesting that we ought to focus a little more on the things of God. I'm concerned sometime uh, maybe somebody comes in and preaches a good message. Maybe I preached a good one time, Kevin, I don't know. But somebody comes in and preaches a great message, and then we go out in the foyer, and somebody says, I said, did you see that race last night at Bristol? My, now I'm, talking about, I'm thinking about the old days. Earnhardt bumped Labonte on the last lap, put him in the wall, and it was okay, you know, and, and he won the race. And so what's, what's going on? And I, look, I like talking with sports so much as the rest of them. But sometimes we get out there, and what's that doing is taking our mind off this great message we've just heard. We need to be careful that when we are gathering for Christian fellowship that we should get in at least some Christian fellowship fellowship. I mentioned earlier, and I told you I'd say it again, but fellowship is closely relinked to unity. And Christ prayed this. He placed a tremendous amount of 
emphasis on unity in John's gospel, chapter 17, that high intercessory prayer just before he was to be arrested. He puts all, remember he prayed for the relationship with himself and the Father, then he prayed for the relationship he had with the apostles, and then he said he's going to pray for all believers, the believers that were there then, even the believers in the future. And he said, I want them to be one, talking to the Father, I want them, I want them to be one just like we are one, Father, just like we have fellowship. I want the, the brethren, the future believers, I want them to have fellowship and unity just exactly like we do. Now, here's what I close with. I don't, there's a lot of thing about this pandemic that we don't know. And the doctors who are honest, they will tell you that. And I've heard some say it. People have asked me, preacher, do you think this is an attack of Satan? Or do you think this is the judgment of God? And this is opinion. I'm no smarter than anybody else. And God didn't speak to me. I didn't go up on the Mount of Transfiguration yesterday. Uh, in Israel or Pilot Mountain or anywhere else. God didn't come to me and speak to me in an audible voice or anything like that. But you say, is it judgment or is it Satan's attack? Is it possible, let me just ask it this way, that it might be an attack of Satan, but God's allowing it for a reason. We see that throughout the scriptures. I mean, think about the days of Moses. They were killing babies. God allowed that for a reason, so that he could raise up a deliverer whose name was Moses and eventually lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Think about in the days of Christ, when Christ was born, they were killing babies, and, and God allowed it for a certain reason. And then he raised up a deliverer, and his name was Jesus Christ. And after Jesus died and rose back into heaven shortly after that, after the day of Pentecost and so on and so forth, there was great persecution amongst the church. And I'm sure there was a question back then, is this an attack of Satan or is it uh, the judgment of God? And still the question can't be answered. But we do know this, that when the, when the Christians were persecuted, they scattered and so God took a bad situation and used it for good because wherever those Christians went, they took the gospel with them. And had it not been for the persecution, they would have stayed right there in Jerusalem. So God can take something that the devil means for evil and use it for good. Think about Joseph. He said that very thing, talking to his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Is it possible that this is an attack of Satan, but somehow, some way, God's going to use it for good. I know this, this pandemic has attacked the unity amongst the brethren. It's attacked fellowship of God's people. And there, there are things we get from fellowship, and I've talked about them tonight, and I'm going to talk more about it when I pick up the second part of this. But there's things we get from fellowship with God. There's things we get from fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can't get any other way except through fellowshipping. <clears throat> There's a reason that Christ placed so much emphasis on unity as he prayed before he was to be arrested because it's important to him. And if it's important to God, it ought to be important to his children. And we should strive to fellowship as often as we possibly can and to be in unity every time we come together to fellowship. That's part one. Lord willing, I'll finish. I mean, this is, I'm finishing this part of the sermon, but Lord willing, I'm going to talk about the test of fellowship, the test of fellowship, either Sunday morning or next Wednesday night. Don't forget Wesley Price preaching on Sunday night here. We're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank y'all so much for coming. You are who are here in person. Thank you folks for tuning in by way of Facebook and YouTube. Uh, love to have you come visit with us. Uh, any opportunity that you have, but I, I'm just really excited. I got to say this before I pray. I'm really excited about seeing Wes and Sheila again. I haven't seen them in a good long while now and looking forward to seeing them and to singing with them this, com this, com this coming Sunday night. It ought to be a great, great night. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you for the privilege I've had to share the word, to declare to the people what you've filled me up with over the last several days. Lord, we pray as we leave this place and go to our homes, Lord, that you would keep us safe as we travel. Give us a good night's rest. 
Lord, help us to wake up in the morning ready to serve you. Be with Junior and I as we go to Taylorsville. Keep us safe on the road. Others who are traveling as well. Be with the Osmond family. Lord, help us to reach out to them. And Lord, take them food and send cards and maybe go by and visit with them. Just let them know that we really care about this family and we want to do everything and anything we can to help them. Bless us now as we go our separate ways. Help us to glorify you in all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so very much. Give me time to get to the back door. You're dismissed. <laughs>